So tonight, I don't think we're actually going to be very long, but tonight we're going to do some work. Uh, tonight we're going to individually do some work, uh, and 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 uh, I want to use I want to start with a scripture uh, that is a very 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 popular scripture when we go through times like we're going through in our society now. Anytime there's a call for prayer, anytime there's a crisis going on, everybody goes to Second Chronicles seven. Right? Most of you even know what it is before I read it, but Second Chronicles seven thirteen says this. God is speaking. He says, if I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, and my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I'll hear their land. I think this is one of the uh, paramount scriptures in the Bible when it comes to, we don't know what to do. Well, everybody says, hey, this is what we need to do. We need to humble ourselves and pray and seek, or, seek his face and turn from a wicked. And that's all good and that's all true and that's all right. But this is what I want to focus on tonight. I want you to listen to this line. My people who are called by my name will. And my people who are called by my name will, and then he gives a list. My people who are called by my name, if they would humble themselves, if they would pray, if they would seek my face, if they would turn from their wicked ways. He gives a list of things that need to be done by the people who are called by his name. I want to drive that home tonight. Notice he doesn't say if anyone who is having a struggle would humble themselves and pray and turn. He says, my people, I'm talking to my people. The onus is on my people. For God's standpoint, God puts the onus to change and transform on his own children. He's looking to the church and saying, if you would, I would heal the land. God has an expectation that we would conform to his will. He doesn't tell the non-believer, I need you to change your ways. I need you to turn from your wicked ways. He's telling the people who are called by his name to turn from their wicked ways. He tells the believer, I need you to make changes. Wow. Romans 12.2 do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you might prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I had a set of requirements and instructions in my house that were part of my family's rules. My family had a certain way that we had to do things. When I was growing up, you had to dress up to go to church. The other kids didn't have to dress up to go to church, but we in my family had to dress up to go to church. In my family, you always had to say, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. No, ma'am, and no, sir. That wasn't optional. The other kids didn't have to do it, but in my family, we had to do that. The, the other one was, when I was in church in a service, you couldn't talk. And I don't know about you, but this is a true story. If I were talking in church, my father would get up from wherever he was sitting, walk over wherever I was sitting behind me, and he would thump me on the back of the head, and then he would just walk back and sit down. It was just like this, hey, you, stop it. And go sit down. And of course, then you know, everybody in the congregation knows that in my family, you didn't smoke, you didn't drink, and you didn't curse. My father smoked, but in his house, you didn't smoke. It didn't matter what the other kids did, if they drank, if they cursed. In my family, you did not. To be under the blessing of my parents, I had to comply with their instruction. So in those times when we went to church and I behaved like I was supposed to, then we would go out to eat afterwards. 
because we'd been good. We would go to Pancho's Mexican Buffet. Anybody? <laughs> $2.99, sopapillas with honey. Yeah, that was like the big deal. My family really loved buffets. But in other words, in order to receive the blessing of God, I have to agree to conform to his instructions. And if I choose not to follow those instructions, then I will not receive the blessings that are available. And again, this is how it works for those who are called by his name. Not everybody else. This is just us. This is just the children of God. So let's go to the opposite side. Unbelievers are going to act like unbelievers. Regardless of our expectation on them, because of the expectation on us, unbelievers will act like unbelievers. Why? They have no reason to act differently than that. They have no expectation of receiving a blessing from God. They have no need of God. They haven't put their faith in God, so they're not worried about God's instructions. And we can't expect people who do not believe in God to be transformed. In other words, they are going to be proud. They are not going to pray. They will turn away from God and not seek him. They will enjoy their wicked ways. But we don't have that option. Not as a believer because we've been instructed by the Father what he wants us to do. And yet I see believers expecting non-believers to act like Christians. It's kind of a fun thing to watch because it doesn't make any sense. Like maybe we should stop and share the gospel instead of arguing with them that they're not acting like Christians. God has an expectation that his children will make the changes he asked them to. Ephesians 5.3. But among you, there must not even be a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. 1 Peter 1, 16, for it's written, be holy because I am holy. And I think the challenge that comes with scriptures like this is we like the God of grace. We like the God that says, you give me grace, I act how I want, it's okay with you. And yet God says, if you want your land healed, then this is my expectation. So let's just throw fairness for a moment out the window. We're expected to become more like God. We're expected to change. We're the ones called by his name and we're instructed to change whether anybody else is or not. I think one of the core, most basic beliefs that we can take on to change our life is to recognize that the only legitimate accountability in our life is God. I can call a friend and ask him to help me be accountable for something. And if I want to look good in his eyes, I will lie to him the next time I do something wrong. Why? Because I can hide accountability from a friend. I cannot from God. So there is a time when I have to recognize that I'm living a holy life, not to impress man, but to connect with God. So I want to read you a chapter of the Bible. And I want you to listen to the instruction for the believer that's in this chapter, because it's kind of an attitude adjustment for all of us. Romans 12, 1. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you will prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think more highly of yourself than you ought to think but to think so as to have sound judgment. As God has allotted to each a measure of faith, 
For just as we have many members in the body, all members do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ and individual members of one another. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each one is to exercise them accordingly. If you have prophecy according to the proportion of your faith, if service in serving, in one who teaches in his teaching, He who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And then he gets more direct. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor not lagging behind in diligence, be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Bless those who curse of you. Bless them, do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Don't be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, and if possible, as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it's written, vengeance is mine and I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. And in so doing, you'll heap burning coals on his head. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I don't know about you, but I go through this list and I just think there's this overwhelming amount of niceness that's supposed to come out of me. But then I look at that and I say, what happened to the scriptures like Matthew eleven twelve? 12? From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violent and violent men take it by force. Ephesians 6, 10, uh, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, put on the full armor of God so you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the powers and against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of weaknesses in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist evil in the day. And having done everything, stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the perspiration of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, take up a shield of faith with which you'll be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I mean, it sounds to me like we are supposed to be a rowdy group of warriors. Now that's who God calls us to be. But then you look at the very next sentence, the very next scripture, 18, it says, with all prayer and petition, pray and pray at all times in the spirit and with this in view be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. Ephesians 6, 12, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against powers and against world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavy place, heavenly places. And I read this and this is what I learned that my battle's not on Facebook. That my battle's not against the government. That my battle is not against the unbeliever. That our battle is against powers and principalities of wickedness. And that our battle is a spiritual battle and must be fought in a spiritual way. And do we need to stand up for Christian values in our country? Yes. Yes but we need to stand up in the places where change can happen. I hate to say this because I'm not trying to be critical, but that person you're arguing with on Facebook has no ability to change the law. Why do you argue with them? Facebook doesn't make governmental decisions. I actually have friends that called me even today and said, you know what? I've decided I'm leaving Facebook And I have such a feeling of freedom. 
Believers need to be doing four things right now. Humbling ourselves, praying, seeking God's face, and turning from our wicked ways. That's our responsibility before God, whether anyone else does it or not, because that's what they call the believer to do. That's what God is saying. If you are called by my name, this is what I want you to do. So I have a challenge for Revive Church tonight, whether you're online or in the room with us. My challenge tonight is that we would take Romans chapter 12 for the next seven days, read it every day, and pray over it as it applies to our life. This is what I want to do tonight to close. I want to take you back through that chapter. I want you to close your eyes, if that's comfortable for you, and I want you to consider each segment for you. Where do you stand in this instruction from God for your life? Is this something you have taken on or something you need to work on it? So if you just want to get into a place to self-evaluate, because I'm going to urge you, brethren, by the mercy of God, present your body as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. It's your spiritual service of worship. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in a brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor. Don't lag behind in diligence. Be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Do not curse them. I rejoice with people who rejoice. Weep with people who weep. And be of the same mind toward one another. Don't be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Don't be wise in your own estimation. Don't pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what's right in the sight of all men. Impossible as far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, leave room for the wrath of God because he says, vengeance is mine and I'll repay. But if your enemy's hungry, feed him. If your enemy's thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you'll be heaping burning coals on his head. But don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. God, tonight we recognize that we're in your family. And the words that you've laid out for us in Scripture are meant for the believer, not for the unbeliever. If my people who are called by my name, you say, if we would humble ourselves, if we would pray, if we would seek your face, if we would turn from our wicked ways, you're going to hear, you're going to forgive, you're going to heal. Got to pray that we're done evaluating other people. And that our goal for the next seven days is to evaluate whether or not we're following your instructions.
God, we want to be blessed in your family. Help us be honest with ourselves. Help us listen to your instruction. And help us make the changes we need to make. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining us today at Revive Us Now at our YouTube channel. Remember to click that subscribe button to Revive Church and share this video with a friend. And if you'd like to support this ministry, go to reviveusnow.com forward slash give.